friend wanting me to be here. I have to say that when Stefan asked me to come here and to speak about energy dimensions, um, I did wonder what I can say to Cure that you didn't already know. <laughs> but um, I'm hoping that we can at least start a, a debate this evening. I think reflecting on Cure's own transition to put questions of resilience and energy at the centre of the study of the urban is itself by an interesting move. And I think it does say something about the moment where we are, where some of our previous imaginaries about future cities connected to concerns about sustainability appear to have rather faded from view. And for potentially very good political reasons. Sustainability has for some people become a rather limp uh, concept, a rather damp script in the international arena, and something which is difficult to mobilize concern and interest around. And in its place we see a whole host of other imaginaries of the urban future that seek to connect the environment to the city. And energy transitions then is one of those spaces in which those kind of imaginaries are emerging. It's of course not the only one, but it is the one that I'm going to focus on this evening. So there is much transition talk around. Uh, many of you will have seen manifestations of talk of transition <coughs> in its various guises, and here are just a few um, images that we, we, might, uh, we might pull together. I'm particularly intrigued by the way the Friends of the Earth have gone all to the great British energy with their Union Jack wind turbine there. But it, equally, how some organisations like Marks and Spencer's or HSBC can declare themselves an on a low carbon transition. What does it mean when we see? the idea of a low carbon transition, entering the mainstream of politics and the economy in these different ways. At the same time, of course, we get a whole host of alternative ideas of transition. So while on the one hand, some actors and agencies might be suggesting to us that transition is sort of business as usual with green bells on it, um, slightly seasonal note, uh, others would suggest that transition means quite radical changes in the way in which we organise society, the way in which we supply our energy, the sorts of infrastructures and cities that we build. And of course, like the term sustainability, it becomes very interesting for us to ask why such different kind of politics around transition can coexist in the same space, which is in this case um, predominantly, uh, I'm drawing on examples from the UK. Uh, why, do we, why are we able to talk with one breath of the People's Republic of Energy and Plan A as both sort of examples of transition? Or why do both those kind of organisations use the idea of a low carbon transition to try to pursue their um, political aims and ambitions? I'm afraid I don't actually have the answer to that because I'm just thinking that that's where we're going to get to um, in this talk. But I do think that it's important for us to reflect on the fact that a kind of a, a broad array of politics is being advanced through this kind of idea of a low carbon transition. And what I do want to investigate this evening is to think a little bit about what that politics is and where we might stand in relation to that politics. There are, of course, multiple imperatives underlying and underpinning this notion of transition, and that's, I think, why we do get this kind of multiplicity. We've got different questions of energy security, operating at very different scales from sort of national ideas of security to securing the energy affordability for particular communities. We've got different ideas about energy costs, whether that involves switching supply or efficient use, different kinds of imperatives around what renewable energy futures we want, what kinds of energy resources are we going to be using, both now in the medium future, the next two to three years, and in the long term. The cost, risk and capacity for infrastructure investment. Um, something that I'm personally working with at the moment is one of the low carbon network funded projects. Uh, everybody must promise not to laugh when I tell you that it's called a customer led network revolution. Uh, but at the heart of that smart grid project is a sense of how do we create new forms of infrastructure um, and who the infrastructure it is and indeed how households might become part of the infrastructure of the future energy system. So questions of cost and risk are critical there. We've also got this kind of idea that we can establish new forms of economy around the low carbon transition, whether that's about household uh, energy services, whether it's about uh, business advantage in a, in a market, um, or whether it's about recognising uh, the importance of not-for-profit forms of economy. And at the same time, you've got the idea, at least in some contexts, and it's important to remember when you're in the UK that in not all contexts is a decarbonisation agenda, we need strategic advantage. 
Of course, uh, some of you will be familiar with the, ca the case of Australia, where the decarbonisation agenda has certainly not been something that has one recent political advantage. Uh, so we've got a multiplicity then of agendas at work. One of the reasons one might say that transition talk has been able to kind of cross over different divides and occur in these multiple different sorts of political spaces is because of the sense that those multiple agendas can be brought together in a way that brings benefit to everyone. What's not to like about new renewable energy and lower costs of energy and more secure energy supplies? I mean, those are all fantastic things. But of course, underpinning that are key questions about who wins and who loses in transition and who takes part and, in fact, who sets the agenda. So on the one hand, the kind of positive connotations of a low carbon energy transition come from the multiple imperatives that they seem to be able to integrate. Yet, as this recent debate, those of you who haven't seen it before, I'll explain the slide in a minute, between, uh, in this case, uh, the Department for Energy and Climate Change and the Centre for Sustainable Energy based in Bristol, as to how the cost of transition should be shared, and in fact how they will be shared. So some of you might have seen this work. If you haven't, I highly recommend the um, report <coughs> written for the Joseph Rantry Foundation by the CSC, which talks about how current um, plans in the UK to reduce carbon emissions <coughs> will affect the poorest 10% uh, of society in the UK hardest. Uh, there's a lot to argue with in that report in terms of their assumption, but it's important work for us to reflect upon. For the CSE, the costs of the low carbon transition are being unfairly socialised. That is, that they're being um, spread out across everyone in society through energy bills, and this, this is why their cost will affect the poorest of society most. Uh, the Department of Energy and Climate Change's own calculations suggest that um, all energy bills will be lower under decarbonisation. Now, neither of these is actually wrong, obviously, because they're all dependent on the different kinds of assumptions that you work into it. But what it does say to us is that those kind of assumptions, the ways in which we think about how the costs of the energy transition should be shared, who should gain and who should lose, are actually critical in, in creating the kind of energy transition that we will have. And so these kinds of discussions about how we think about questions of justice in energy transition become central. Now I want to, to make the argument, um, one that I have made uh, uh, before, that understanding, and perhaps not a very surprising one, um, understanding that how transitions work in practice and their politics depends on understanding their geography. And of course you, you'll know that I'm a member of a geography department um, and, I, and I tend to like that identity. But I want to specifically pursue this question of the urban, in which I think the sort of agenda that Cure is developing, where you've got multiple different disciplines and different perspectives coming together, is critical for actually understanding um, that politics and that practice. So, you know, as one could create hundreds of these kinds of slides with lots and lots of pictures of uh, icons of uh, urban transitions initiatives taking place around the world. These, again, born from the UK making some very um, different kind of arguments about what a low carbon transition might mean. So talk of the low carbon urban transition is to be found in a range of different contexts from Didsbury dinners, I was quite surprised to find that, but I am pleased uh, because we've been trying to argue in our low carbon network funded project that uh, cooking is, is, the, is the new black that we all need to think about, low carbon ways of cooking. Uh, so I shall be probably leaping through this on the way home if I can find it. Um, but equally, you see something like Low Carbon London, the Smart Grid project, also funded by Low Carbon Network Fund um, and the uh, power company, UK Power Networks, versus something like Transition Newcastle, a community grassroots based um, approach to transition. Now, in uh, work that I've been doing over the last few years with Vanessa Castanbrotto, who's now at UCL, and Gareth Edwards, at St Andrews University. We've made the argument that central to this kind of politics of urban transitions is something called climate change experimentation. And what we suggest about experimentation is that it's a form of the way in which climate governing takes place in the city. It's conducted through in particular kinds of interventions, which are both social and material. And then we argue that this is an explicit practice of experimentation which seeks to create spaces of exception where alternative ways of relating the city to climate change 
take place. So we describe them as kind of purposeful interventions seeking to reconfigure social material networks. And I can say a lot more about the, the kind of um, theoretical arguments behind that if, if you're interested later. But what I wanted to do now is just, um, for some of you who haven't seen it before, to just show you a little bit about what we found out about experimentation and then say something in reflection about what that means for transitions before we turn to the questions of justice. So we looked at 100 different cities globally and did a survey of secondary materials and uh, of, of uh, secondary sources of information <coughs> about those cities and what they were doing in response to climate change. And we found a very um, regular, if you like, a regular pattern of experimentation taking place in cities such that none of the kind of usual indicators about cities told us whether there would be more or less experimentation happening in that city. So whether it's a very rich city or a very poor city or a very big city or a very small city, within 100 cities which we have previously defined as global in a way that I can also explain later. So it is, a, it is of course a sample of cities. But across these, experimentation in the way that I previously just defined it is becoming something that is taking place um, with Relatively, uh, a relatively strong occurrence. We found about 630 examples. We find that experimentation is very much concentrated in the built environment and the urban infrastructure sector. One of the things that that suggests to us is that these sites within cities become <coughs> newly related to climate change, particularly urban infrastructure projects. The urban infrastructure is becoming refashioned in relation to, in this case, decarbonisation. And although we, our project started off looking at climate change, uh, in general, only 12% of the uh, initiatives that we looked at had any form of adaptation in them. So it became much more, in the end, about decarbonisation. And as uh, something like two-thirds of these projects had the energy system at their heart, uh, much more about transitions in the energy system. We also found a very um, interesting patterns in terms of who is experimenting in the city, such that while municipalities dominate, um, the roles of the private sector are very, very significant. So something like 42% uh, of things that we looked at, 630 examples, had a strong role for the private sector, and about 20% uh, for the third sector. So there seems to be this kind of phenomenon of trying to govern climate change through experimentation in cities. And how can we start to explain that, on the one hand, and then how can we start to think about what that might mean for transitions um, and then the extent to which they might uh, enable a sort of new form of urban justice. Well, to start with, I want to make the argument here that central to these forms of experimentation as spaces of exception in which new ways of relating to the city can be trialled are distinct urban imaginaries about the future. Some of you may have seen this kind of transition talk from some of the leading politicians at the urban level. Now a few years old, but similar kind of statements can be found uh, of more, more recent origin asking us to recognise that the future of the globe will be one or lost in the cities of the world. Unlike other um, actors on the world stage, cities seem to be seeking responsibility to act on climate change. So the question of course comes from, comes to where does that come from? I found it interesting to try and see how these kind of ideas of urban futures are not just being manifest in, directly in the policy world, but also um, perhaps in some more surprising sites. And there is now, for those of you who, who are not climate change aficionados, but there is now a, um, a genre of literature on climate change. And uh, leading <coughs> through this literature, one finds the city in, in many different guises. But I particularly like this quote from Ian McCune's book, Solar. But the idea of the unease and fascination with which we view the city in its relationship to climate futures, the giant concrete wounds dressed with steel, ceaseless traffic, the remains of the natural world could only shrink before them. The idea of a kind of dystopian urban imaginary and its unsustainability is of course uh, very central to modern culture in the, in the West in particular. The pressure of numbers, the abundance of inventions, the blind forces of desires and needs looked unstoppable. This kind of sense of the city as the problem that needs to be addressed um, in relation to climate change. The hot breath of civilization, he felt it, everyone was feeling it on the neck, 
similar sorts of dystopian images of what future climate change might bring to the city are also found in other genres of, of, uh, of cultural age and this from the day after tomorrow. Anybody's actually ever watched a day after tomorrow looking for cities? If you haven't, then you probably find them, uh, many of them. Sao Paulo's there, Sydney's there, in Paris. Paris there. <laughs> Paris. Paris isn't there anymore. <laughs> London's there. I mean, uh, very many major global cities are, of course, present in that film, and none more so than New York. <coughs> but I think these kind of, uh, although obviously <coughs> saturated in both literature and film genres, these kind of ideas of a dystopian urban future are also present in the way in which cities are responding to climate change. As a sense that the city is the problem of climate change and it is also the space where uh, the problems of climate change may land in the future. And these kind of ideas of needing to create other forms of resilience, may I say, <laughs> and uh, urban ecological security in response to these kind of challenges is central to, to an urban policy. Right, this is a slightly blurry um, image. I really liked it, but I couldn't find a clearer one, so apologies, but I will explain it if you haven't seen it before. This sense, though, that the city is also a space where a transition to the future that we want to borrow the present, this real conference, can be found. So that if we don't follow scenario X on your left, we can instead have scenario Y, in which the city is, of course, everything that we want it to be. It is green, it is a pleasant land, it is, it is sustainable and people talk to each other and we have everything that we need and the children play in the streets and um, no gardens anymore and you know, all of those things. We all shop locally and it's an, an, a kind of amazing idea about what the city can become in response to climate change. So the climate change here is the kind of, can bring out the very best of ourselves and the very best of our cities. And it's this kind of idea of, the, of a utopian future that I think climate experiments are really seeking. Um, they, they may be born out of a, an unease about the dystopian nature of the urban, but they, they, they form around this idea of the utopian. So what is at stake then in the urban response to climate change are very much competing views of what it is that the city can become. And a sense that in, in relation to climate change, the city can become something other than it is already. And in this sense, climate change experiments can offer a means through which we translate kind of utopian ideas of the city into the real city. And in this way, they act as a, as a heterotopia, as Foucault describes it, kind of effectively enacted utopia in which the real sites, all the other real sites that can be found within the culture, are simultaneously represented, contested, and inverted. This is not a utopia, heterotopia is not utopia made real, it's not as if everybody involved in a climate change experiment is always nice to each other. But it's a, a space in which the utopia becomes inverted, contested, uh, and experimented. So we suggest uh, um, that contemporary climate change experiments are discordant within the city, offering both the sort of opportunities of the future, but also uh, their limitations. But they involve the creation of new forms of social order. So any imagination of the future city, of course, imagines a future social order within them. So here we suggest that experiments have become critical sites and moments through which new forms of social ordering that relate to the future take place. And central to these imaginaries are these ideas of rights, responsibilities and recognition. So I'm just going to turn now to think a little bit about the ways in which concepts of justice are being enacted in these kind of moments of climate change or low carbon transition. Of course, questions about the city have long been framed in terms of questions of justice. But what we're suggesting is that as climate change becomes a new way of ordering the city and then imagining its future, new kind of questions of justice are emerging. And these are the kind of questions that we might want to ask. And I think these are the kind of questions that are, are already very much part of the work that uh, colleagues at Manchester and in Pure do. So that's why I was wondering uh, what I could say to you that you didn't already know. But uh, I think at least it's worth putting them out on the agenda for us to discuss. What kinds of rights and responsibilities might um, be located in cities as they seek to respond to climate change? How do we deal with differences within the city? 
any of you have ever looked at sort of urban plans for low carbon transition, they tend to be relatively universalizing. So it tends to be an idea that, say, London should reduce its greenhouse gas emissions by 60% by 2050 or 2030 or whatever it is. But the question of how do you share that, who should take the lion's share of that and who should not, remains unanswered. And I do, uh, uh, well, it's, it, to call it a game is a little bit, it's probably blowing it up more than it is. It's basically a piece of paper with a lot of the other counters. But what I ask my students to do um, is to say, okay, if you, if you have a city where you have four equal groups in population, you have to take away 60% of emissions, who do you take them away from? Do you take them away from the richest quarter of the city or from the lowest quarter of the city? How do you make that decision? And that takes, you know, at least two hours of them saying, we don't know what to do, right? what should we do? I don't know what to do, what do you think we should do? Is there, is there, is there a way to actually physically try to think about what that means? What does it mean to reach a decarbonisation target in a very unequal urban environment? How do we recognise those inequalities as we go forward? Equally, these questions about procedural justice, I mean, it strikes me that probably most of the population of, of London or indeed of Durham don't know that there is a low carbon transition plan um, at work in their city. How do we engage municipalities with the people who, for whom they govern? It's a big urban question in general, but it becomes very much manifest um, as we start to make significant structural changes to cities over the next 50 or 60 years. It's not the sort of thing that you want people not to be involved with. And how do we involve those people who might normally be excluded from such forms of decision making? So some of the work that we did as well as sort of survey work, we did some in-depth case study work, it's probably about eight or nine cases that we've done as a team, with Vanessa Garrett and myself and some PhD students at Durham, John Silver and Andreas Lickley as well. And what we've been seeking to do as part of that work is to analyse how these questions of justice in terms of rights, responsibilities and recognition are being manifest in particular um, urban climate change experiments. We find very strong evidence that what is occurring is the creation of new forms of carbon responsibility which seek to make either individuals or uh, community groups responsible for addressing climate change. So in an example from TZ, a low carbon development on the outskirts of Bangalore, we find very much this idea that uh, Matthew Patterson and Johann Strippel have, have written about of the conduct of low carbon conduct where individuals are given responsibilities for managing their own behaviour within the development within the lines of its um, goals. So every house is fitted with what is explicitly called a conscience meter. Uh, you and I might know that as an energy meter, but uh, in the context of uh, teaser it's called conscience. <coughs> in uh, a project where I did some field research in Hong Kong looking at a project run by WWF and HSBC called Climateers, there's a sense that uh, in the absence of the state's role, the government of Hong Kong uh, does not have a low carbon target as yet, um, that the way in which a low carbon transition should be undertaken is through kind of self-help and self-reliance uh, to achieve these kind of governmental goals. So individuals are charged with signing up their friends, family and neighbours towards uh, climate change goals um, and to get uh, other people to make commitments to address climate change. And one of the interesting things about this scheme is that it's so far worked predominantly with the lower uh, income groups within the Kong city itself. And where it's been most active is perhaps in some of the communities which are most low carbon. So when people were asked to fill in a low carbon calculator, which included things like how many flights they took a year and where they went to by ship, uh, and what imported food they ate, they found it extremely difficult to fill that, low, that carbon calculator in, on account of the fact that none of those things are things that they did themselves. So this kind of assumption about who it is in the city who should be um, responsible for the low carbon transition and how that politics is working out is, I think, an area right for our intervention. I think there are also new conflicts around climate change, um, both low carbon and resilient forms of uh, urban response. Um, as this uh, quote from researchers at IIAD makes clear, the kinds of changes needed in urban planning for climate proof cities are often supportive of development goals, but they can do the opposite. 
So what do we do when those family cars conflict with other forms of progressive urban politics? Yeah, and who, uh, who decides? So to just wrap up some of the um, kind of key points that I've made and hopefully leave a little bit of time for discussion and for wine drinking, which I believe is very important part of this evening. <laughs> um, I just uh, for a, a few points. On the one hand, we might feel rather overwhelmed and, and slightly sort of worn out by the talk of energy transitions. It's everywhere, uh, late party conference to the... Uh, to, uh, what the Conservatives want to do to energy costs and so on and so forth. This talk is so cheap that it might seem worthless, but it's very politically potent. It sets potentially the pace for infrastructure systems and investments that can last 50 or 100 years or more, and it can have a profound impact on the urban arena. Climate change experiments, we find, are proliferating, and they are enacting this form of heterotopic politics where different kinds of imaginaries of the future that we want are gaining ground. And I think it's therefore important and imperative on us actually to be involved uh, with that future politics. In those sites then are woven through these ideas of what a just transition might be, so new forms of what constitutes climate justice are implicitly being made into those um, contexts. And so far that has been very much a focus on the individual rights and the individual responsibilities around climate change, with less space, I think, for a collective sense of what justice um, and what a just energy transition might involve. So we're suggesting that multiple pathways of decarbonisation are creating new forms of social contract in the world. They're creating new senses of what our responsibilities are as societies and what responsibilities of others might be too. These are always then about remaking urban societies so that en urban energy transitions are never just energy transitions. They are about multiple other things at the same time. And I think this is the kind of agenda that uh, Cura is very well placed to address, not at least because of its uh, past record in being able to translate research into policy, but also because of its interdisciplinary focus and its, and its clear commitment to questions of justice and resilience. So thank you very much, and I look forward to discussing it with you.